This is the last session in the tower for the day. This is Weeding Out Security Bugs in Debian by Javier Fernandez Sanguino Peña. <laughs> yes. Um, I, either way, I also need to announce that we're going to try and shorten this boff by a little bit so that people have time to get ready and catch the bus for the formal dinner. That leaves at seven. Okay, right, um, I'll just hand over. Thank you. Well, thank you all. So, um, well, first I'll present myself. The name is over there. Uh, she almost got it right. Um, what do I do for a living? Just so you can know my bias and, uh, and what I, can I do right and what can I do wrong. I work in ID security stuff, so that's why I do a lot of ID security, security packages in Debian, okay, like uh, Bastille or Snort or Nessus or whatever. Um, so um, I do penetration tests for large companies and uh, uh, what else, and, and development of security gateways and stuff. And the main goal of the presentation is, okay, I, uh, so provide information for uh, all Debian developers, uh, those that are here, those that are way back home, and those that are here this talk afterwards, on how to uh, fix or really uh, tie on to the pr uh, ways uh, that Debian fixes security bugs, both in stable and stable, and even testing, okay? So give you information you can probably uh, dig about uh, more afterwards about uh, how, where, where are we right now, where are we going to, and uh, I'll go through all these uh, different topics, uh, starting, so how is the security right now of, of a Debian operating system, okay, taking a look at, uh, based on the advice for choice we've published, what are the security packs we usually have, uh, how are they handled, uh, how many do we have per release, okay, and how does, uh, where, where is that going to? Mm, describe also the work of the different teams, uh, both the security team that works and handles security bugs in stable, the security testing team that handles uh, security bugs that go through uh, unstable and testing for the next release, and also the security audit team, which is probably the most recent of those and what works uh, it really does. I'm a member of the security audit team, so I will probably talk about some of the lessons we've learned when handling uh, uh, security advisories and bugs for uh, developers that might be of use to you, uh, so uh, we don't encounter the same problems again and again when handling security issues. And um, I'll probably, if we have time, and that's probably uh, the workshop, uh, the most uh, workshop side of the, of the talk would be showing how uh, some uh, insecure code and showing, showing also some tools how to uh, test that code. Uh, that's some of the tools with the audio team uses, okay? Um, and finally, we'll probably, and that's not for me to say, we'll talk about how uh, we can improve that in the long term and, and maybe some recommendations uh, that we all have to uh, do uh, to in order to improve the current status. So, um, yeah. So, uh, what's the impact of the bugs uh, that uh, end up being security bugs in the operating system? So, I guess. All of you are aware of this, but just in order to repeat that in Cerner and focus the talk, uh, when we find a security bug in the, oh, well, we find or somebody else has find a uh, security bug in, the, in our operating system, it means that at that point in time, uh, even though we might not know it yet, all our users of the stable release are at risk. So they might get uh, cracked and all their servers might be compromised. It be it a remote uh, flow or a local flow, that means that they, at that point in time, are at risk. It means that both Debian developers and the security team, sometimes more the security team than the Debian developers, are really stressed out to provide a patch to our users and send that away so we can uh, really fix the issue that it has been found. Uh, when that is done, I mean, uh, when we have a patch available, since we do backports of the patches, that really sometimes is maybe a three-line patch, but sometimes it's not, and sometimes it's really difficult to, to do because most uh, upstream just produce a new version with the security bug included, and we have to, or well, the security team has to remove the bug, uh, has to remove all the non-security fixes and just go for the security fixes. So when that is done, uh, uh, and that uh, is published to our security uh, uh, update servers, that means that at that point in time, all the users that will be downloading things from security.debian.org are going to stress all the, uh, the, well, now it's a mirror network, and now it's actually, I think, three of them, right? Uh, so and they're going to stress those, and they're going to stress the 
bandwidth of those, and that happened. Uh, that's the reason why we now uh, have more than one security uh, server. So we used to have one, and now we have three. And uh, uh, what happened, I think that, uh, that started being changed when the security patch for X uh, was published last year. So uh, the, both the security mirror and the bandwidth just collapsed because of downloading all the full uh, X packages uh, updated for with the, with the security fix. Even though we might produce a patch, some users that are not running, uh, uh, you know, updates regularly, and they are not uh, even they might not have for some whatever reason security.degen.org on their APT uh, sources list, they might get compromised even when the patch is available. So that's. That's a no-brainer too. If they don't have the patch, they get, they get compromised. And in the end, uh, well, and, and that actually happened, and that we actually published. And if you see uh, some of the news, uh, uh, sometimes have been published are related to security, time to fix on uh, whether we do fix the stuff or not. In the end, I mean, there's a lot of buzzing going on whether we do provide a good uh, security support to our users running stable or we do not. Okay, so that ends up affecting Debian uh, images as an operating system and our, our work as a project, okay? Um, so as we will see, the security bugs uh, tend to increase, which is really so the resources, all these resources that have been stressed out get stressed out every time more and more. Okay, so first common security bugs, and these are no-brainers, but yes, also to for those that are not that much in the security arena, uh, is that Obviously, all software has bugs, okay? We, we have to uh, accept that as a, as a fact of life, so we have to live with that. And also, uh, some of those bugs are gonna be security bugs in the end, okay? Um, there will be variance severity of security bugs. It's not the same to have a local uh, root compromise than to have a local you know, games compromise or whatever in the system than to have a remote buffer overflow in an essential package that is being installed, maybe syslog or, or whatever. Um, so it's not the same, we're gonna have different security bugs of different severity, okay? Uh, that's also very important when we go to the data uh, phase, or the lies, dumb lies, and, and statistics phase that we're gonna go through. Um, but, uh, so it's not all the same, and even so, the kind of bugs that are gonna appear in the distribution will vary by time, so we're not seeing right now, or we're not publishing fixes for the same kind of bugs that we were fixing uh, uh, we were publishing fixes for three years ago. Uh, that's uh, sometimes because uh, there's a new kind of bug that, you know, it's a buzzword and everybody's going looking for them. Or maybe because the focus has shifted from some kind of bugs uh, to another kind of bugs. Or maybe because, because we already fixed most types of bugs uh, of some other kind, okay? Um, if you go, uh, I don't know how many of you are aware of the Coverity uh, funding, uh, well, he, uh, that company does a, uh, 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 publishes, well not actually publishes, has a, 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 um, a product that it's a source code auditing product, okay, and they got paid uh, along with Simon Tech, I think it was uh, this year, they got funding from the U.S. government, the Department of Homeland Security or, or whatever, uh, to do a source code audit on uh, free software projects, okay, so they got funding to take all the source and audit that and publish the uh, vulnerabilities they found and give them back to the developers. So they actually uh, audit with their tool, uh, that Samba, Apache, Open BSD, OpenSSH, and some of the projects. You have all the stuff up about the website, but the, um, the end of the, uh, one of the things that might be surprising is that they end up finding, on average, on mature uh, products, and uh, we're not shipping all, uh, all our, of our packages are not really mature products. Uh, they got, uh, on average, that, those numbers of, of security bugs. Okay, some, some of those that they found were not really security bugs that could be exploited, but in the end, that's the number of, of bugs that they were eventually found. And they got patched by, by those projects in recently, okay? So that's um, uh, uh, 0.3 uh, security bugs per 100,000 lines of code. In, in those projects, okay? So we're, that's uh, probably the lower level we can see. So that's uh, generic uh, uh, thinking. What about uh, we in Debian? Well, um, 
as you all know, the size of the distribution keeps growing every year, so we got more and more packages, and that's not stabilized, so we get growing. We keep growing and growing and growing, unless, uh, unlike other projects like maybe OpenBSD that has a stable core and that's you know doesn't vary that much with time, or Fedora Core, which they don't put that many uh, new packages inside. We keep growing and growing and growing, and we're supposed to do security support for all the stuff that is eventually released. So if we release Edge in December, all the packages that are going to be released with Edge should have security support, and those are way more than the ones we released with Woody or Sarge, and Sarge are way more than the ones we released with Woody. Okay, so um, uh, I gave a talk about um, security three, uh, I think it was yeah, DEF CON three, right? Norway, uh, yeah, Oslo. Uh, it was a very fast talk, I, didn't, I had to take the plane, so it wasn't uh, my best talk. Um, uh, it was not focused on fixing security bugs, it was focused on security in general, but some of the issues that I uh, pointed already on this, on the security side, especially the number of bugs uh, we were getting every year, uh, it keeps uh, being the same, okay? Um, so, yes, uh, you have all, I didn't mention this, it was on the first slide, all the data uh, on all the code I'm gonna use, and maybe even tools, not, not actually tools, but code, is up at Homer, okay, so Homer, uh, dot, well, homer.mexico.decomp.org slash share slash JFS, okay, you have, all the stuff there, so you can know that. Uh, you also have uh, for the people that are outside here, not on the DevConf, people.debian.org uh, slash whatever, JFS, uh, DevConf 6 security. Uh, it's all the stuff that I'm gonna use. Actually, there's more stuff at uh, people.debian.org, okay? So uh, the data file there, that's, um, it has some of the data I've been using to produce some of the information that I'm gonna show you here. So, let's see some lights. So that's the um, total advisors proof for Debian. Okay, that's, that's the number. Uh, if you see uh, for Potato, we published 197 uh, Debian security advisors and that number of, of covering that number of vulnerabilities. So we not always, uh, some advisors cover usually, and that's when it's very typical with kernel uh, vulnerabilities when there's a backlog of them. Uh, an advisory gets published that covers more than one vulnerability, so uh, that's the number of advisories, and in, in parentheses, that's the number of uh, vulnerabilities that were fixed on the advisories, okay? Uh, those are probably lies, so you can go and look them up yourself if you want to. Um, so if you look at Potato as compared to Sarge, we already have um, that many uh, DCAs published, and we go way beyond those, and we have uh, that, uh, those uh, numbers from, you have them on the paper of millions of lines of code are based on the work of uh, some guys on the, uh, Spanish university. Uh, it's actually uh, the University of Rey Juan Carlos. So they do an analysis of software uh, projects. So they got that numbers of a million lines of code uh, per uh, distribution, per release we, we've made. So if you see there, we, we actually have a lot of uh, of millions of lines of code and also a lot of uh, advisors being published, okay? And that keeps growing and growing. Uh, actually, that number, the final number of, main, of, of DCAs depends actually on how many years of maintenance we've done for that release, okay? You probably see it clearly uh, here. So that's the line, uh, you, you see here, that's the line for potato. So that's when we end up uh, not providing any more advisories for that because we end up uh, finishing, it wasn't security supported anymore, so it remains stable. That doesn't mean that it, they didn't have any more bugs, it just uh, meant that we didn't fix it then, then anymore. And you see that's the line for Woody, which is going to end support. Uh, you can correct me on this, I think it's uh, June or July this year. We're not gonna provide security advisories. Well, that was June, July this year, or uh, Edge, whatever, came first, so it will probably be June, July this year, uh, right? So, um, and that's the number of DCAs. If you take into account uh, SARS, that it's been, uh, uh, that's the count, accumulated count of uh, viruses uh, as time goes by. Uh, you see more or less the same trend as for, as for uh, uh, Woody, which actually m makes a lot of sense. Uh, we actually have uh, probably as many bugs as uh, Woody and maybe even more. We obviously, some of these advisories that got fixed here were present both in Sarge and Woody. 
if you, you have that on the data file, there's an, uh, an open office chart there and you can look those numbers up yourself. One of the interesting things is that uh, the, the packages being affected with DCAs on uh, shards, uh, you know, if you take them and count them, are, are different than the ones that we, they got fixed for Woody. Actually, most of the DCAs were for packages being in section net and section uh, web, which actually those numbers for the web packages are not as large uh, in Woody and not even in Potato. That's, that's one of the things I was talking previously that the focus of a uh, website, uh, web oriented vulnerabilities that's cross site description, SQL injection, and um, file system file inclusion or whatever um, are getting more attention here. So we have, we even have more packages here than uh, related to, uh, to web. Uh, applications that we had in back in, in Potato or in Woody, we have lots, lots of uh, PHP applications that get uh, security vulnerabilities published uh, frequently. But uh, uh, we have actually have uh, more TCH published now for web applications that we had back in, in, in Woody. Okay? So those, that's the first fancy graph, and I think I have another one. So I'm gonna talk about the teams and then uh, try to uh, show you some stuff. Uh, that's so you get an overall impression. Feel free to, you have any questions up to this point? Any comments here? No? I'm gonna go through, um, this is uh, essential because I want you guys to uh, make sure that you know what the security teams do, and uh, so I'm gonna go through them. Okay, so uh, we have three security teams right now, uh, which uh, uh, the one that's been running for longer, that's the stable security team, which is how to call the security team. Um, which is the one handling security bugs. Uh, they are the ones that are um, monitoring vendor uh, slash uh, sec, that is a closed mailing list for security bugs among all um, uh, actually Linux distributions and other free software distributions. So it includes BC, uh, BSDs, uh, uh, Red Hat, uh, SUSE, Mandrake, whatever. Um, we have the security testing team that handles security bugs in testing and they do that with public information so they don't use uh, closed information for that. I'll go that into a later, into more detail later. And there's the security audit team whose goal is to find security bugs in the distribution, actually both in stable and in unstable. So uh, how do these teams work? Okay, well, I'm gonna show you some more timelines before talking about teams. Um, for, oh, actually the slides are over there also at the places I pointed to, just in case you don't wanna follow here the screen. So, um, more than lies of what security packs we usually uh, get fixed in advisories are these. Um, well, as expected, most of them are dealing with user input, so that's buffer overflows and uh, uh, improper data handling, whatever the, uh, that is. But we also have design issues. I'll go into more, more detail of, of, of what some maintainers do that are not very, um, uh, they don't think much of a security when they do the design of their packages. Uh, we have boundary condition, access validation, but well, the most of them are actually remotely uh, exploitable vulnerabilities, so if you sum up uh, buffer overflows with the model exploitable. You have uh, all those DCAs that meant a remote, uh, uh, local, remote code uh, exploits um, when they were published, okay? So those probably meant the, those with, uh, which have more severe impact uh, to us. Uh, so that's the data from 1998 to 2006. If you, if you skip that and you go to data just for just one year, you probably see the focus on some specific vulnerabilities and not another one. Um, but that's over, okay? So, and, and that's a fancy graph, another one I made, uh, because not all securities are, uh, advisories are equal. We don't actually publish uh, risk information on the advisories, okay? So when we publish an advisory, uh, the user doesn't actually know uh, if, if he should apply that really fast or not, or if he has the software installed. So that's based on uh, CVSS, which is common vulnerability scoring system, which is something that Johnny made by uh, Cisco and other, and uh, Feast and other guys, uh, which actually had uh, scoring for our 
vulnerabilities. So that's, um, that's uh, what's the distribution of the, our vulnerabilities are. So if we're all thinking that the vulnerabilities we usually have in Debian are, you know, like local gain stuff that, I mean, for things that are not really that common in, in Debian, so they don't get that much installed, that's not really that true. Um, so you hear, see here the biggest of the pie, and that's the, actually the average. Uh, those are with scores seven that are actually remotely exploitable vulnerabilities, not necessarily remote root, which would be, you know, the 10, 9, 10 over there, but are actually really severe, okay? So that's actually the types of vulnerabilities we usually have in Debian, which means that we're probably missing a lot, lot of other vulnerabilities that are not getting fixed as much. So that's the last fancy graph, so that would be probably the end of the data. So before I go into discussing the teams, let's do some hands-on and um, so you can see what I'm talking about. And actually, that's, that's a package that I made myself. It's called Hello Insecure, based on the Hello package. Uh, that actually starts up as a uh, server daemon. And uh, well, actually, I wrote a lot of crappy code. Uh, well, actually, I reused some code and then make it crappy. OK? <laughs> so, so if you go and take it, uh, take it I'll, I'll show you guys. And uh, these are actually stuff that uh, are, is done by some uh, uh, package maintainers that gets up needed to be fixed as uh, a security bug. So I'll sit down and I'll show you. Okay. So, oops. I feel like a rock star with this here. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. So, what do we have there? Add uh, the hello sample. I want you guys to look at. Uh, so, let's finish this first. Go over here. Is that big enough? Okay, so, hello. You all guys know the hello uh, package, which is an example of how to make a package. So I made the hello insecure package, which is an example of how not to make a package. <laughs> and it's actually based, I'm sorry, but I'm not used to the US keyboard. Actually, that's, this laptop is borrowed. Uh, so it's actually the same stuff, minus some other things. Actually, you, you guys have here, um, these is, are the differences between uh, the original one and the, the one I made, which hopefully won't see the light out there, except for Google, but, um, so priority extra, and let's not blame Santiago for this one, okay? <laughs> yep. Oh, sorry, maybe my, can you hear me now? You hear me now? Yeah, okay, sorry. So I said we're not gonna blame Santiago for that one, so I changed that, but in any case, uh, this package provides an init script, um, so it actually provides a demo for that. Hmm. Sorry for my mistyping, okay. Uh, an init script, which is your average init script, okay, it also changes the post int, uh, post inst, and actually it also removes the init script, so it's nice there. And here's what it does, install a new, um, those in scripts there, which is actually kind of average. It, adds, uh, it actually adds some new option to hello, which is hello minus s to run as a server. Uh, I should tell you guys to be careful not install these packets uh, on your systems unless you want a remote uh, compromise, root compromise. Okay. Did I save that first? No. Hopefully not. nobody installed it, right? Did some? Huh? There's no internet? Oh crap. <laughs> Oh crap, I depended on that. Well, good. You, can, you cannot even get to Homer? No? You can? Well, I cannot, so you guys stop leeching. Because I, I want to do some tests outside. Okay, I'll try them inside. Um, so, well, well, you fall from here if you didn't have it. Um, so it adds, a, it adds a new argument to the main sources with the server, and then, oh, let's see, it adds all this crap. Well, it's not actually crap. It's based on uh, micro init, which is not mine, I borrowed it. 
and it's actually code to start a listening diamond um, port 1025, which is somewhere over there, port number, um, maybe here. It starts, it starts up log even, there you see it, very nice log. And, um, and it starts up, uh, well it forks and it opens up the log and when you say something it will answer to you. So we can start that up if you want to. If you don't have, in, if we don't have internet, that probably means that you, uh, I cannot get uh, cracked. I wouldn't want this, this laptop to get cracked into, so I can probably launch it from here. I wanted, I wanted to launch that at home, so I couldn't get cracked there, but I'll do it here. So th you guys don't be too nasty. Uh, is that compound? No, is that hello? Okay. Hmm. Okay, I'll probably have to distract that one. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, crap, sorry. I didn't know why I do that. So we have a hello that we can just start up. And that means we can connect from here and say, hi. That's a very nice diamond to have, right? So actually we can do this too. It's probably not that nice. And we can probably do this too. Mm -hmm. I think that buffer is big enough. Uh, okay. So, um, this daemon, if you install that program, that uh, you see the children died there, both children died with uh, six segmentation fault, you see it here? Okay, that, that package, if you install it, it will actually install uh, uh, a diamond that has both a formal string overflow and a buffer overflow. And it will install it as with root privileges and then you're screwed if you install this guy. Okay, so that actually happens. And um, one, okay, you cannot blame the package maintainer for some of the stuff, but you can blame him for some other stuff. So let's take a look about uh, probably this thing. Better. Mm -hmm. So here the maintainer, so that's me, decided that, hell, I can, no, oh, there. I can just start up this guy as root uh, user. So that means uh, I don't have to fuss around with uh, whatever logs or it does, it will work fine or whatever. So that also means that I'm opening up a very big hole. It actually starts, if it's at the back diamond, it starts on all interfaces, so I probably shouldn't do that either. And you didn't see that probably, but another, uh, and it's not that uncommon thing, is to have stuff like that. So when you install the package, it will create a default thing, so it will not start a package uh, if you just install it, but for whatever reason, it will change that to yes on one new installation, and it actually will dump the changes to ten, uh, the temp file before moving them to the config file. That actually is really uh, crap, but you see that on maintainer scripts. So that means not only that if you install this, you get a root remote uh, hole, but that you have a local root uh, uh, DOS because of following symlink attacks, okay? Uh, and these are examples that probably uh, you can see in some packages. So uh, those are depending on the maintainer, some others are not. But probably the maintainer shouldn't do this either, which is enabling debug of uh, the binary, which actually is the one uh, that makes this guy write to a lock, okay? So even though this is crappy code, uh, and maybe the maintainer shouldn't have packaged it, uh, there's some things that the maintainer could have done to avoid that being really crappy packaging. So he could have 
uh, have that package uh, be running as a non-root user. He, he could have uh, written a proper posting script and he could probably have removed the debug code from there. Okay, at least uh, change that to something useful and not TMP doing an F open, which is also crappy here. There. So um, I actually, when, when talking with some guys, they say that even though they maintain packages, they don't have to learn or see code or even understand that. Uh, but they probably need that too in order to find security bugs. So uh, if, if you guys want to, does um, uh, you want guys to spot some bugs? I don't know if anybody is, uh, how, how many people actually have get to download these files from Homer? So just Joey? Nobody else? <laughs> Two guys? Nicholas? Somebody else? Okay. Well, so you cannot spot that many bugs if I go too fast, but Actually, the bugs in the server code are here highlighted, so if you guys want to look, look at them later, you have them nicely uh, commented out, commented in, actually. So there's a few of them, okay? So here is an example of, of insecure package that is uh, some uh, of a decision of the people, of the person writing the software itself and some is other decision of the maintainer. So that's actually very common in Debian in some cases, and I, I will actually show you some later on. Okay, so I promise to talk about the security teams, and I will. So there, okay. Any comments up to here? Yep. Uh, I have a question for my C. Yeah. Uh, uh, Benjamin asks, uh, Benjamin Seidenberg asks, if will the security team, hmm? sorry, yep. will the security team do an audit of a package by request? Uh, not the security team, but probably security audit team. Yes. I will see the teams later on. Uh, actually, it's one of the things I want to bring to you guys. I mean, there's a, a few people out there, and probably uh, let's see if we can get more into the team that can probably review stuff before it goes into either unstable or, or whatever, okay? So uh, actually our goal is to fix that before getting to the release. Joey there? If anyone would like to download this locally, I have a copy on my laptop, which is uh, dragon.local if you're using MDNS, or it has an IP address of .152, and it's in the tilde Joey directory. So in inside slash temp, so um, dot one five two slash tilde joey slash tmp. You can also FTP to Homer directly by number. It's a hundred dot one, uh, and that works as well. So thank you, Joey, for that. I couldn't. I I didn't set that up. I actually have a USB stick if, uh, with all the stuff in it. If anybody's interested, we can probably pass that around if you want to. Does anybody want it? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Hope I don't have much confidential information there. <laughs> uh, actually, I don't use it that for company stuff, but. Um, so, ask Aki if you want to, just uh, put your hand up and I'll throw it again over there if you guys want it. Um, it's actually both uh, what is it's in the USB stick and also what's up at people.debian.org is actually all the talk, the source code, all the talk, the data, the source code, and many other stuff so you can play with. Um, so while you're copying that, I'll go through the security team, different security teams we have right now at Debian. Um, well, the main security team is the Debian security team, surprisingly. Uh, and that is made up of, uh, it fluctuates, it's usually four to six members. Uh, Martin Schulz is the one that is leading it up now. It actually has different kinds of members. It has uh, the, you know, the members that can actually publish uh, security fixes on the build uh, diamond network that, you know, actually gets those into the security uh, uh, server. And there's actually members that are called uh, secretaries that are the ones that do the hard work and do the patches and you know follow all the stuff. So that no one they, they get called that. Um, but uh, there's some full members, that's how they call them, and there's uh, some secretaries for that. 
Um, so Steve Kemp, who is also on the security audit team, is, as, uh, is actually um, a secretary right now. And there's uh, some other guys uh, right now uh, that have been doing. Actually, that, this has changed because there, was not, there wasn't enough people, so some people got uh, included there recently to, in order to uh, be able to uh, pick up the backlog of security fixes that needed fixing. You okay? Okay. So what do these guys do? These guys are the main point of contact for Debian for uh, both VendorSec, which is the uh, private mailing list used for security disclosure, and it's, uh, I guess that's um, non-full disclosure. Okay, so these guys get the heads up when a security bug is found on OpenSSH and it's not yet public. Uh, either because somebody found it doing an audit or either because somebody uh, with a honey net or with a honeypot system got a, a first uh, version of a zero day code exploiting it, okay? So this uh, is usually discussed on VendorSec. And they also are the primary content for CERT, which are the guys that handle security issues, you know, kind of the, those that affect all the whole of the internet. So an open SSH bug will probably ha be handled by CERT, which usually, which right now is actually called US CERT. So it's not the cert any longer. But um, they also tend, uh, try to review, and that's a, a quite a cumbersome task. They try to review a backtrack on all the security databases out there to see if there's a security issue published there that it affects us. So they, uh, if they uh, find that, then they contact the maintainer and try to get the security fix uh, done. Okay. Uh, so they make the patches, usually with help from the maintainer, and that's not always true. So if something happens, something doesn't. And they publish that, publish to that to the build network that handles the security uh, build diamonds for all the, all the architectures we support. Um, they, on occasions, and that is not that much uh, often now, they follow up on compromises to Debian systems in order to see if that compromise was uh, because of a zero day vulnerability or it wasn't. Actually, I think they don't do that much anymore because most of the compromises, at least uh, those uh, that are being discussed on Debian security mail list, are actually people that have servers with default passwords. So they end up being cracked because of that. Actually, I have a, I didn't mention this, I have a honeypot system out there which is running search with no security updates and it's been running since, uh, I think it's last year, um, May. Was it May? Um, it's part of the Honeypot system deployed by the HoneyNet Alliance. So it, that's HoneyNet.org. Honeynet and that system has not been uh, compromised at all uh, for one year and doesn't have any security patches. Uh, but what you do see on, on the outside, on the wild, wild internet, yeah, we'll go there in just a minute. I'll finish and I'll let you uh, make the question. What you actually see, most of what uh, I've, uh, we've been seeing on the HoneyNet Alliance is actually SSH brute force scanners more than people uh, trying uh, be zero day on non-zero day vulnerabilities on Linux systems. So they, these guys go more for the Windows systems, but still. Mm, so what was the question there? Well, can you guys hang over the micro? Yeah. I was interested in... It's working now? I was interested in knowing about this uh, Honeypot server uh, with charge without security updates. Uh, uh, what kind of network services was it running? Because that's the most important thing, I think. Yeah, okay. Uh, so network services it's running, it's Exim uh, as an uh, MTA, so that has security bugs with advisories. It has, uh, it actually has courier, both IMAP server and POP3 server. It has a DNS server which has also security bugs uh, needing fixing, and I think that's about it, which are not very popular services, but probably all, all of them exploitable. Okay, so it's, it's not a default install because uh, uh, um, luckily, well not luckily, thanks to people doing the Debian in install work, the uh, default Debian install doesn't install as much uh, servers as it used to do back in the days of Potato. Okay, so it's not a default install. It actually has uh, accounts uh, with uh, maybe about, uh, uh, I think it's around 300 different accounts that work. Yeah, they've been generated randomly with names of Spanish people. Actually, they, they are 
the names are actually very funny. Um, <laughs> so you have a random number, uh, random name generator that ends up with having 300 accounts with uh, well, non-default uh, username and password. So not put that easy, but it actually has four or five service, services that could be remotely deployed, and they have been not used at all. It actually replicates um, uh, an SMTP, you know, mail server setup that is very common in the internet. So you know, mail server, pop server, EMAP server. Uh, and DNS. Okay. Um, so that's the work of the security team. So uh, this is the work of the Debian security testing team. These guys, uh, some of them in the room, follow up the issues that are public and in order to see what issues are really fixed or pending in the, uh, in the testing release. Okay. So they work with uh, public information, and that's uh, um, information from uh, sources that uh, declare a given version vulnerable, or even the uploads of uh, package maintainers that say they have fixed the security bug on some place. So they also look up bugs labeled tag actually security on the BTS and see if they are fixed on different, on unstable, and see if they are fixed on edge right now, okay? So the main goal of this team is to, and, and they started working, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they started working uh, actually for uh, Sarge to make sure that the security bugs, we wouldn't have to have published a lot of advisories as soon as Sarge was released because we had a backlog of security bug, uh, um, bugs there. So they actually helped the security team during the freeze to make sure that all the bugs, security bugs were fixed on, on, on Sarge, okay? Well, while they were being fixed on, on seed. Uh, they actually, the information of the, um, I didn't put a reference there, but they, uh, there's, uh, if, you, uh, if you Google for that, and, or you've read the, the recent mails Debian Debell announced, you will see that they have a, a public page with all the bugs that affect uh, testing and affect seed. And there's actually a tool right now that is called Deb e Scan that runs through that list and checks your local packages and tells you these and these and these are vulnerable because it haven't, hasn't been updated yet, okay? Um, so um, they review that. Uh, they actually, at some point in time, if they if it need to be, uh, it's not that common, but because the main goal is to have those security bugs going through seed into edge right now. But they can, and uh, there's a build infrastructure for that right now. Uh, they can provide uh, Debian uh, testing security advisories along with patches just for Edge, okay? So there's separate uh, um, security support for Edge that is now gone official. Uh, you probably see in the mail to Debian Devil Announce. Um, was Debian Devil Announce or Debian Announce? I don't remember. Debian? I, I, I heard Debian Woman, but I <laughs> probably not. <laughs> okay, so that security support started September last year and it's now official kind of, oh, so you can, uh, the, they're integrated with all the security mirror network, okay? Uh, so you don't have to go to another uh, apt ar archive to download the security updates for testing. Yeah, there's a question over there. Michael? Uh, not really a question, but just some more information about the testing security team. The, uh, you mentioned that the SID and Edge are tracked um, by the testing security, but we also have uh, quite a bit of Sarge on there tracked, and one of the things that we end up doing most of the time is tracking issues, and we need more people to do that, so if you want to work uh, testing security, it's fairly easy to do, and everybody's welcome. Yeah, actually they have an SVN uh, repo, right? Yeah. That uh, has a database of the CVA names with security stuff, and actually the only work that has to be done is add new CVA names that affect us, right? And label yeah. them, maybe high risk, medium risk, or whatever, so they can get tracked, right? Yeah, mostly it's uh, trying to identify whether a package, or whether a known security issue is a, in a Debian package, and if not, uh, if so, file a bug, if not, ignore it. It's fairly easy work, actually, but it's a, quite a bit of menial work at times, so. And one of the things that really helps them track security bugs is when maintainers fix a security bug, say so in the change log, and actually put the CVE CV name on it so they can uh, grab for it. 
Uh, actually, if you, you guys don't know what CVE is, you can go to cve.mitre.org, and it's actually uh, a project uh, sponsored, uh, funded by the U.S. to provide names, distinct names, to vulnerabilities. So you can, uh, it's actually, they call themselves a dictionary and not a database. So they actually give a name for that. Uh, we actually, um, not only for the testing, for stable, for those advisors that have been published, there's a, uh, up on the website, there's a page that lists all the CV, CV names for all the Debian advisors, so you can go to the page and see if, if a CV name, uh, when has it been fixed. So you, can, uh, you can go to uh, uh, worldwideweb.debian.org slash security, and you'll see a link there to a cross-reference table that actually shows you that force table, at least, Debian security advisors. And there's other, another one. We probably have to update the information on the website to uh, cover the security testing team now if that is official. Or more official, I would say. So, and now the security audit team. It's actually made up of five or four people, so you can guess that it's not enough people to audit the whole archive. <laughs> okay. And it has even even uh, manpower issues and even more issues. So, some members actually started uh, audience, aud auditing stuff back in 2003, so, but the mm, group itself didn't merge until 2004 and started up a mailing list and started working you know, together to uh, do all this stuff. Um, so actually one of the things we, we've done is um, each member of the team is focused on reviewing a certain type of uh, vulnerability in the packages, so it tries to find all the instances of that type of bug. So it's not like we take a package, we sometimes do, and audit it fully, but just look for some kind of bug in all the packages, okay? So like for example, I focus at some point in time all, uh, on, on symlink attacks on the temporary direct directories, okay? So there were a lot of Debian and security advisors police related to that uh, because of the audit work. Uh, Steve can uh, focus a lot of on, on many uh, problems with said uh, git games, uh, uh, which actually could, um, have maybe have buffer overflows or overflows to em environmental uh, variables, so he audited a lot of them. And uh, Ulf, I could not say the surname, <laughs> actually audited a lot of former string attacks and, and, and some other uh, buffer overflow kind of types on, on many applications. So actually it's not, it's not like we audit the full archive for all security bugs in a given package, but we focus on a certain specific kind of vulnerability and we try to find that on all, all the instances in the package that we find. We actually end up uh, finding more bugs which are not the ones we focus on. So we might end up seeing crappy, really crappy code and, and, and it end up uh, making some other bugs because of that. So the, um, as the end result uh, of the last uh, I don't know what that percentage is relates to, but I think it's the last year, uh, maybe since, uh, no, maybe since it started. Uh, of the Debian security advisors that were published, uh, the 81 were made up, made up because the Debian security audit team found the bug, informed the maintainer and the Debian stable uh, security team, and that was, got published as a DCA. And actually there's a, well that was, those were bugs that were affecting the stable release, uh, bugs that were not affecting the stable release got sent to you know the upstream maintainer and the maintainer and got sent as bugs to the BTS, and that's actually the count is 121 or 22. I don't uh, I don't know if that number is correct. You all got, you have all the listing of the bugs we found on the Debian security advisors we've that have been published because of that work uh, up there. Okay, um, we'd also have developed some tools uh, to do some automatic source code review, which are very you know alpha status. Uh, but uh, kind of uh, try to review some other work. Okay. Any comments up to here? No? Not an IRC either? No? Good. Sorry? Oh, the answer for that? He didn't catch it? Yeah. Okay, can you repeat that on IRC yourself? Oh yeah, okay, okay. Actually, I, I don't think I answered that actually. <laughs> but yes, now that we're talking about security teams, um, the Debian security audit team at times has been asked by maintainers to review some code, and it has done so. It, we don't, we, we haven't get many requests actually, but we actually are 
very open to doing that if, if somebody asks to uh, review the design or, or some code and see if we can find some stuff on it before being published, okay? Um, so, some tools we use that are actually in Debian, so there's packages for those, and, and I want to present them so you guys can use that also, but you'll see, and that's a hands-on uh, uh, piece of work now, that they are not as good as they probably could be if uh, we got more work, people working on them. Uh, actually, um, these tools are really not as good as the Kubernetes tools. Uh, so I'll mention them. Uh, we use RATS, and that's a, a rough auditing tool system, which is very, really rough. <laughs> okay, so that's a C-coded uh, tool to review both Perl, Python, C, C++, and I think, uh, did it miss anything? PHP? Okay, it actually works with a database that only, it's only a listing of, 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 um, of actually library calls that are known to be insecure. So it flags them and points them to you. So it says, don't use this, don't use this, because of this, this, this. And it has a you know, kind of a risk uh, metric associated with maybe using uh, system call or get s call or o uh, open or f open call. So it will try to highlight some place of the source code that are using um, calls that are known to be wrong and tell you, mm, you maybe shouldn't be doing this. Uh, as you might uh, uh, think that ends up uh, generating a lot of false positives because maybe the guy that is using uh, the system call is using it properly. So uh, uh, you have to take a look at the code and actually to actually know if it's working or not. Um, Flow Finder written by David Wheeler is a Python tool that analyzes just C and C++ codes. It tries to go way beyond just uh, maybe a pattern matching on asteroids and tries to f uh, find the library calls that are known to be insecure and then do an analysis and see if they are actually used properly or not. So like for example, a former string uh, uh, problem in a syslog call, it would not just look at and say, okay, you're using syslog here in this piece of code and it's known to be insecure, but it will also say, okay, you're using syslog and you're not giving it the format parameter, so I know you're doing it wrong. I know it for sure. And um, even it might look at the parameter and say, okay, you're not putting a, li a limited size in the parameter, uh, so you're not doing it wrong completely, but you should improve that to uh, limit the size of the, of the thing that gets sent to syslog, okay? So we'll actually take a look at, a uh, uh, little more in detail look of the code, but it only covers uh, those languages, which uh, means that it doesn't cover all we have in the archive. Then we, uh, we use pscan, which is just not general purpose, only focused on finding former string overflows. Um, then a uh, member of the audit team developed um, audit source, which is a Perl module that will actually run all the tools uh, on the source code and will tell you the input of all of them. Okay, it, it actually has a tool to color the code, so it can show you in the code with a different color, sorry, uh, what is the place that you have to uh, look at for, okay? Um, well, we all obviously use grep uh, a, a lot uh, for looking for source code. Um, we also use uh, brute force tester, that is B BFB tester that would actually try to look for buffer overflows uh, on environmental variables and um, uh, actually on parameters. So we try to find uh, those kind of buffer overflows uh, in some programs by doing a lot of testing. And some of the black box tools uh, we might develop on uh, to do some testing. Um, if you guys take a look at those tools, I think we have hands on now. Oh, sorry. Okay, uh, let's take a look at those tools with some really crappy code I wrote a few days back. Okay, so that's, if you guys take, take the multiple bugs uh, uh, archive, um, which is over there, uh, we'll see some really bad code, uh, which is, Actually, well, there's not that density of bugs in packages, thankfully, but it actually has a lot. So let's take a look and let's use those tools and see what we get here. So you get the feeling of what we do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <coughs> you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, so I think I got the thing right here. Uh, closed. Well, I 
actually don't need it, right? Um, <laughs> so, in order to not make it easy, I've, I've removed the comments of the code. So this is sample code that will uh, use a log file. It actually, well, the purpose of this code is to uh, find, try to find a comment in the system. So it's actually a replacement of which, uh, but uh, very, very buggy. So it will actually use a log file. You see the location of the file there. It, uh, that's what it will try to run, which is which. Um, it will initialize and run in, uh, print into the log file who uh, what, uh, which user used the tool, and uh, then it will ask you for the command to find for using get s, and it will execute something, it will tell that to syslog, and it will tell you what you were finding for, okay? So like, um, mm -hmm. so, it's this code. I, th I think I've provided in compiled version uh, all over the place, but if you guys want to compile it, just run make, and the make file should take care of that if you make it clean first. So, yes, uh, so you take a look, it will just do this. So, really simple code, right? Um, so, uh, if you run rats over this, which I should have, I don't have a flow find that is installed here, so uh, you guys can, I have the output right here, here so can see the output um, here. If you run RATS, it will tell you these things. So we say, okay, uh, code line number 23, you have a fixed local buffer that might be an issue. You're using getenv, uh, don't trust that. You're using sprintf, you maybe should use snprintf. Sn You're using getes, uh, mm, why do you use that? Actually, the <coughs> compiler, GCC will tell you not to use getes. Um, so if you check out the, the warnings, you should see that. Uh, using sprintdev, using syslog, be careful with this. And using system, and be careful with that too. Uh, why should you be careful? Because maybe you can get stuff like this, which is somebody trying to inject code, which, which is actually successful, okay? So a guy will just uh, use the command to run ls. Uh, that wouldn't be much of an issue if, yes, if, if this is a single command in the system, but it will, could be worse if it's a server command, and it could be even be worse if it's a set uh, UID. Set UID? Is that how you say it? Say UID? Set it? Set ID? Set UID? UID, thank you. Set UID command in the system, okay? Um, so that's an instance of a bug, but we have more bugs here. If you guys want to check it out, you can do things like this, okay, and we have a cementation folder because of the use of the environmental user variable, okay, because the, there's a buffer over folder. Uh, we can actually see that. Uh -huh. So you see there the guy trying to go over <laughs> to AAA calls, okay, that's a typical buffer overflow. Too many calls. Okay, great. Yes. Uh, actually, that's one of them. Uh, but we can do worst also. So what? Up, oh, sorry. That's just about coding. It's not exploitable. Yes, it is. Okay. So what do we do? This. Not a cementation fault. Why? That actually is twice in the system on the code. So that's because of the syslog call. That is the, has a form of string overflow. Okay. You guys see it? Is it clear, more or less? Uh huh. But uh, you guys will notice that it running rats didn't bring up some other issues. Uh, so like, what about this? So what about, oh no, let's clean the lock. Uh, I think it's that lock, yes. Uh, so you have a lock there in a temporary directory, which uh, is just, if open it, oh no, this, this is a giveaway. <laughs> Comments, no comments, no comments, 
no comments. Come on, Kyle, no comments. So that's actually because of this, uh, which is crappy, and this, which is also crappy. So we'll just append to any file, whatever that is. So that's vulnerable to a symlink attack. So if I point a symlink to whatever thing, it will overwrite whatever it, it got there. Even if that's a problem, even if it's a user non set UID application, because that, I, that means I can actually get the application to overwrite anything the user can write to. So that might be, you know, bash profile, uh, you know, his own uh, data, whatever. Um, if you take a look at the RATS output, it didn't say anything about temporary stuff. So it missed that one. So that, uh, that shows you that it, it actually doesn't find all the bugs that you can have over there. Well, uh, okay, if you guys, um, if you run Flow Finder, you will get a different stuff, which is this, um, which is more or less the same, but we'll see the difference now in a minute. Okay, so it's more or less, it provides you, you know, you're using uh, syslog, you're using system, you're using getemv, using fopen, that's not good, that's not good, that's not good. It will actually provide you um, a metric based on the number of bugs you find. Um, you can actually, these tools, you can tell him, tell them not to print stuff that might be, you know, a given risk metric. So, um, what bugs are actually there, we can see just running this. If we compare the files without comments with the file with comments. So that should show us all the seven security bugs it has over there. At least the bugs I know I've run, I've written into it, might have some more. So how coded log file location in a shared temporary di directory, a buffer overflow here, seem like an attack here because it doesn't check the file. Um, well, it doesn't check the return value, which is a security bug, but still. Get is with this, uh, you can get a stack overflow there, you can get a buffer overflow here, and you get a form string overflow there. And of course, the common in injection we saw first. So that's probably a large density of bugs for what? Uh, uh, 39 lines file? Mm, but, uh, well, I took some time to actually fix so, some of these I introduced. So this is the guy that fixes those bugs or tries to fix those bugs uh, doing, well actually didn't move over the log file stuff there, but you'll get the idea. So this code actually tries to remove those bugs by not setting a, um, not setting a maximum uh, uh, size of the buffer, uh, trying to use fgets instead of gets, trying to um, check if the thing you're giving it to him can uh, inject code on the system call and actually do a syslog call that would not overflow. So, 15 <coughs> minutes, test. Oh, good. So if we run this guy, and we do the same things, probably would not work. At least I tried to not make it work. Uh, do I have the getm call here? Ah, I didn't move that over. Okay, so, um, However, if you run rats over this guy, you'll see one of the issues we have in the audit team, which is that even if those bugs are fixed, you will eventually get all kinds of warnings about those bugs. So we, uh, we went from, I don't know how many were there in the original one. It was 11. Question? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, from seven to Four warnings, which are really crap. Okay, yeah. Um, did you uh, account for uh, the input having a single quote mark in it? I didn't see that in the code. Uh, yeah, yeah. I use a regular expression for that, but we can try. Maybe I didn't fix it properly. So you mean like this? Mm -hmm. Like this? Right? Uh, well, like. Uh, it actually uses um, um my go really fast here, but we don't have much time. It actually uses this uh, regular expression to filter the output. So if, it, uh, if the input uh, information doesn't fit that one, it will, it will bail out. Okay, yeah, that looks good. Okay, I, good. Missed, I missed that, sorry. Sorry, I, I skipped through that one. Um, okay, so one of the issues here is that even though we know that's fixed, you still get four calls out of 11, okay? 
And uh, actually the same happens for Flow Finder. I think I have the output here. So you get three instead of uh, how many of them were there originally. Uh, on this guy, multiple box here. Uh, three instead of ten, but you have three. You have to look for. Okay, I want you guys to have the idea. So hopefully you have that already. Okay, so some lessons learned of the audit team. Um, I'm probably going to, going to go fast right now because we have the formal dinner at seven, so I have 15 minutes left. Um, uh, the lessons learned, I'll go into more detail on them, but it's actually, you can look that uh, by yourself. Uh, you have some code there you can look at, but it's actually some uh, things I've referenced to either, either the DCAs or the back numbers that actually uh, were related to that. Well, some lessons um, is that uh, interacting with developers, maybe m many are not really aware of what a security bug is. So I, I got really scared when I was uh, bringing uh, temporary Simlink attacks to guys and uh, through the BTS, I, they didn't really understood the attack and what it could happen with that one. So that maybe means that uh, security, uh, well actually package maintainers have to know a little bit more about security coding in order to understand the bugs and the issues with bugs, okay? Uh, actually, there's a lot of uh, stuff uh, we found that we haven't fixed yet because the audit team tries to provide patches with their bugs, not just saying, hey, here, you have a bug here, because we try to test if it, that bug is actually there, if it works, if it can be exploited, and depending on that, we take one action of another one, which means that there's a lot of backlog of probably bugs we haven't investigated yet. But yes, uh, um, Yes, uh, from my experience, just from the temporary uh, symlink attacks, possible symlink attacks, or race conditions using shared directories, uh, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them in our distribution. Okay, one of the issues uh, is that uh, we have a lot, also a lot of code to audit, and unlike the OpenBSD team, we don't have a common re uh, repo of all the code, so we have to go one by one downloading the packages and. Uh, reviewing that. We even have to know if the guy making the packages use, use CDBS, uses their patch, or using whatever, because we might be looking at code that is not actually the one that gets compiled and installed in the system. So we have to actually not only download the code, but you know, even actually build the package to get the final code that would be used on the build. Okay, so that's, and that for one package is not a lot of work, but for 15,000 packages, you can imagine that's a lot of work. Uh, We've seen that the tools we have are useful, but still need some work. There are a lot of false positives, and fixing security bugs takes a lot of time. So, just some examples. I go through uh, these slightly fast. Uh, I just want to point to them because they might be interesting. I was involved in these. Uh, there might be some other interesting DSAs, uh, but I wasn't involved in them. So these ones are ones I think are interesting. Uh, DCA six five six, which was fixed. Uh, I think it was January last year. It's actually a, a VDR daemon that is used to, I, I don't know what it's actually used that, to handle a video recorder uh, on a Debian system. So you can uh, uh, get a video stream from them. Maybe somebody's more familiar with that. I actually just found the bug and reported that. Um, the guys that uh, did the package, I don't know if any of the maintainers here. No, yes. Um, what they, uh, what they did is install the uh, daemon that would run as root, okay? Uh, even though the install file from the upstream say, please don't run this as root. And what they did is, well, we just put an etc default file saying don't run this at startup, okay? Which obviously, if you install the package, you want to install that because it only provided that daemon, okay? Um, so we found, uh, well, we found an, a bug due to being able to actually overwrite any file on the file system, okay? Because you could do a symlink attack through an F open call. And that meant that through that DSA, that, that got fixed and it was a three lines fix, but we couldn't fix on a DCA, okay, um, that it was running as root. Which meant that if the guys that doing the package would not have uh, taken the decision of run that uh, guy as root, uh, that wouldn't be that much of an issue, okay? Because it wouldn't be a, a DCA. Uh, maybe even a DCA will be published, but not as, you know, we didn't have to publish it that fast. 
because uh, we will go from a remote uh, root overriding any file to a remote uh, local user overriding the use files it can get access to, which is not as severe, okay? Um, you guys have all the stuff there, probably some of the diffs and stuff uh, that actually went to, uh, through the DCA on that file on DCA 656 uh, tar zipped. Uh, this one is interesting because it's an example of a web application, a PHP application running with a database. Uh, actually, it's an, uh, I don't know if you guys know it, it's Acid Lab. Well, Acid, which is a project that uh, started at Carnegie Mellon University to provide a GUI interface to Snort. So you can actually see the alerts that Snort sends to the database in a graphic way. And you could do analysis of the alerts that were sent and, you know, graphs and stats or whatever. Um, actually, the bug was found by somebody in a fork of, of Acid, which is called Base, uh, on, and was published on, this, um, on the mailing list of uh, SourceForge. So that uh, we found about it later than the, the bug was published when it was visiting Base, because fortunately, I was both a co-maintainer of Acid Lab and a sponsor of the guy that was doing the Base package. So uh, when we saw that, and we saw the fix from upstream, which is really crappy because it was just, uh, okay, uh, they got published an SQL injection bug, and the upstream maintainer fixed it by uh, doing a, removing, uh, how do you call that, uh, dot semicolon on the input stream, okay? Which is a really crappy way to fix an SQL injection bug. Okay, so you guys have there on the uh, tar um, zip file, the upstream fix, so you can take a look at it, and you see how really crappy is that. Um, just without knowing the application, you can see that's not enough for an SQL injection bug. And the actual fix that got into uh, DCA-893, which is actually a filter of all the data going in, which fixed both SQL injection and cross-site scripting bugs, at least most of them, in the, in the application. What didn't get in was something that we should have done uh, uh, earlier, that is, Okay, this is something that is used to, you know, a local administrator to debug his snort, uh, to check out his snort database. Maybe it shouldn't be open outside. I mean, maybe this shouldn't be installed so that anybody can access it, okay? So those are the fixes that got into seed and that didn't get, got in, get into charge. So you got all the files over there. So lessons learned here is that AppStream doesn't always know how to fix a security bug. I mean, they might try to, but they might not get it right. Um, there are security bugs that affect some packages that go all the way to other packages, which base was not unstable, wasn't testing, wasn't even in testing, was just unstable, and acid lab was actually un unstable, and testing and unstable. Well, it's better to restrict access to web applications if you're not sure if they have been audited, that's, that's for sure. And actually the fixes, if you see the fixes on the div, uh, actually the same fixes for the cross-site scripting attacks are, uh, are the same as the ones that we introduced for the SQL injection attacks. Okay, and also lesson learned here that it's mixed with the other DCA I talked about is that uh, you cannot always uh, push a security fix that will be 100% zero even because, even because it changes too much of the code and, uh, and it's better if that gets fixed beforehand because you're not gonna get a very good fix. I mean, the security team is gonna uh, tell, okay, we're just gonna fix this little bug. We're not gonna introduce new stuff, new stuff here we don't want to introduce. Okay, there's here some more lessons and even more. And if you're still bored, you have another lesson there. So I'm not gonna go through all of them because we don't have more time. Uh, so how can you help? And it's, it's really important. So it's important that uh, the package maintainers learn how to spot security bugs. It's not that difficult, really. It's uh, tools help, not 100%, but some stuff is really evident. Uh, but if you don't look for your own code, the, the one you're writing, either the one you're writing or the one you package, there's, there's no way you're gonna find a security bug, okay? And uh, so if, uh, if package maintainers also program the code they write properly, they wouldn't be uh, security bugs on the design issues uh, I talked about and some, even the maintainer scripts I showed you about. Uh, and there's people doing stuff that is not very secure and needs to get fixed later by DCA. So it's important that like, package maintainers review the own applications uh, and, and talk with upstream and track the security bugs there and, and try to help the security teams uh, track those bugs too. Because it's not the same if the, they, you see in the numbers of the security teams, it's uh, five guys, six guys, four guys. 
It's not that many, but we have what a thousand developers. We probably will get pr better if uh, uh, all the developers will uh, review the stuff they do package and maintain. So how to prevent and minimize? So try to please, please, very pretty please, don't include alpha, beta stuff, online stable, and if you do, mark it as not going to the release uh, through Edge, okay? We don't need alpha, beta stuff that we have then to security support for two or three years. I mean, we don't need that. Really, we don't. Uh, and if you do it for yourself, just, you know, leave it unstable. And if you really don't ha have to, just leave it unsperimental. At least try not to get that into stable because that means that uh, an overpowered uh, 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 you know, a team with a low manpower will have to deal with that. Uh, try to use uh, privileged uh, users for demos and cron tasks. I, I was trying to get that into the developer's reference. Didn't make it through um, uh, Andrew Bell, so I ended up putting that on the security uh, Debian manual as a new chapter. So I'll try to uh, expand that so to provide tips for people writing uh, stuff. So try to do it properly for Debian, okay? Obviously, a voice said, uh, GID said UID software. I didn't talk about that, but if you have security bugs, and those are even worse. And there's a section on the policy that talks about that, so please take time and uh, read about it. And try to provide a safe configuration for the stuff you package and maintain. So if you don't, are not sure that should be enabled, please don't. There's a question here. I think uh, there is one problem with this. As I, <coughs> as I have saw uh, a lot of popular packages, uh, not in Debian in general, especially web applications that are popping out everywhere, that uh, are made by people wi which uh, spill out a lot of co code <coughs> fast and doesn't have any clue about security. Uh, the problem is, uh, which is the trade-off you have to do because, uh, because you want that software into Debian because it's so popular, but you know that uh, there could be many security bugs in there. Okay, what is the trade-off? The trade-off is please get that audited. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a team that will try to get that audited before it gets to Edge if you ask for it. So please, if, you don't, if, you have, uh, if you're not sure that will introduce too many security bugs, don't just say, okay, we'll take about care about this later because the problem is not gonna be you taking care of that, it's gonna be the security team taking care of that and they're already uh, uh, very stressed out. So if you have an application that you're not very sure if the design is good, if uh, it's uh, taking input uh, properly, if it has SQL injection banks, yeah, just try to bring it to the audit team and have that reviewed. I mean, if not, we probably end up having to, you know, just say that applications this, up to these applications are security supported and these 10,000 applications are not. I mean, what's best for our users? Okay, yeah, Donald, have a But it doesn't matter if, if the security team isn't interested in maintaining it. The question is whether or not the maintainer themselves is actually interested in, in maintaining the package. Yeah. So if you're gonna upload a package to Unstable, you need to be in a position to take care of security updates for that package for the next couple years. If you're not in a position or you don't think that the security team is going to be in a position to do that, uh, and odds are they're not, um, then you maybe shouldn't be uploading it. So, But if you are fine with doing that, then it's fine to upload. I mean, if you're gonna do the work of the security team, I mean, I, I mentioned what the security team does in absence of the maintainer. If you, you're gonna do that work, you're gonna track bugs, you're gonna fix them yourself, then, oh, then do it. But I mean, uh, you also notice that a security bug, as I said before, as soon as it gets announced, you have a time to fix, a time to patch, and a time to install the patch. So that all that time taken account means that your users are vulnerable to that. I mean, if they're gonna hold you accountable for that, you better maybe ask them to use backports or use testing or use whatever, okay? So um, the applications you maintain have to be reviewed, so you, can, you should make sure that you review how option answers to bugs, security bugs, well, some of the maintainers do not answer the security bugs or fix that uh, in a wrong way. And if he has a very bad security track record, and you can, can go to public databases and check that out. Um, maybe you should not be packaging that, if he has a lot. So just to end up uh, uh, with a very bad mouth on my behalf, some conclusions, and you have a few more slides, but I guess so you guys can take a look at them later. Um, even though there are gonna be more security technologies introduced to protect our users, and that means cell Linux, like Manixalk talked about uh, Monday, 
that means GC4.1, uh, that means you use stack protection at, uh, uh, prevention, so it prevents most buffer overflow attacks, uh, maybe even packs, excess shield, or s back or whatever gets introduced. That means uh, that those are going to handle uh, some bugs, but not all of them. Okay, so you should uh, uh, take that into, don't think that GC4.1 or sailing is, is going to be, you know, the magic one that is going to uh, make us not worry about security bugs and not publish DCA so, because uh, they're there. Um, so we have to work uh, in a group and that involves security teams and involves maintainers to uh, weed out all the security bugs, okay? Uh, try to code there in a secure way, as I said. And you can use those tools I've showed you uh, in order to review your source. The problem is those tools will support only some sort of code. So if you're writing on, on, on maybe T, TS, TCL, TK, or Ruby on Rails, or I don't know what else, maybe those tools don't so support your code. So try to fix those tools so they do. And uh, you could do well. I've, I've passed through all those lessons learned. But you could do well and review those uh, and how that might have applied to you. Um, uh, because those past mistakes, uh, if you learn about them, might prevent future past mistakes. Okay, so running out of time now. I th well, actually, out of time, right? Now. So you have some more questions there? No, no more questions. Not any questions. Okay, then. Thank you for coming.